Greetings, everybody. My name is Bob, and I am basically a reporter commenting on news. Now, the U.S. State Department has a proclamation on anti-Semitism. But before we go there, what is the U.S. Department of State? Well, its uh, website is www.state.gov backslash about backslash. And we'll take a reading here. It says, our mission the U.S. Department of State leads America's foreign policy through diplomacy, advocacy, and assistance by advancing the interests of the American people, their safety, and economic prosperity. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just a reporter. I'm uh, not saying I agree or disagree. I'm just reporting the news for as long as we are able to, right? So let's take a look at something. All right, let's take a look at the definition or defining anti-Semitism, as they say. Now, the U.S. Department of State has actually an office of the Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. So they have a special office, a special envoy, that monitors and combats anti-Semitism. So let's take a look at defining anti-Semitism. And I'm reading right off their website. Matter of fact, there's going to be links down below. The Department of State has used a working definition along with examples of anti-Semitism since 2010, 2010. On May 26, 2016, the 31 member states of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Freudian slip there. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA, of which the United States is a member, adopted a non-legally binding, a non-legally binding, quote, working definition, unquote, of anti-Semitism at its plenary in Bucharest. This definition is consistent with and builds upon the information contained in the 2010 State Department definition. As a member of the IHRA, the United States now uses this working definition and has encouraged other governments and international organizations to use it as well. So who is this International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance? Let's take a look. Go to their website. All right, well, their website is www.holocaustremembrance.com backslash about us. So, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance unites governments and experts to strengthen, advance, and promote Holocaust education, research, and remembrance and to uphold the commitments to the 2000 Stockholm Declaration. The IHRA, formerly the Task Force for International Cooperation on Holocaust Education, Remembrance and Research, or, uh, uh, or TF, was initiated in 1998 by former Swedish Prime Minister Goran Persson. Persson? Today, the IHRA's membership consists of 34 member countries, each of whom recognizes that international political coordination is imperative to strengthen the moral commitment 
of societies and to combat growing Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. Okay. So, um, let's read the next paragraph. The IHRA's network of trusted experts share their knowledge on early warning signs of present-day genocide and education on the Holocaust. This knowledge supports policymakers and educational multipliers in their efforts to develop effective curricula, and it informs government officials and non-government organizations active in global initiatives for genocide prevention. End of paragraph. End of whose paragraph? Uh, end of whose genocide? Good question. All right, let's go back to the State Department. In Bucharest, on the 26th of May, 2016, we read, in the spirit of the Stockholm Declaration that states, with humanity still scarred by anti-Semitism and xenophobia, what is xenophobia? Oh, that's a fear of foreigners. Hmm. The international community shares a solemn responsibility to fight those evils. The Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial call the IHRA plenary in Bucha uh, Budapest 2015 to adopt the following working definition of anti-Semitism. On 26 May 2016, the plenary in Bucharest decided to adopt the following non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism. All right, so let's take a look at some of the definitions. Now, I've got screenshots of this, but you could also go to the website and, you know, take a look. Quote, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews, Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities, unquote. To guide IHRA in its work, the following examples may serve as illustrations. Manifestations might include the targeting of the state of Israel, conceived as a Jewish collectivity. However, criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism frequently charges Jews with conspiring to harm humanity. And it is often used to blame Jews for, quote, why things go wrong, unquote. It is expressed in speech, writing, visual forms, and action, and employs sinister stereotypes and negative character traits. Next paragraph. Contemporary examples of anti-Semitism in public life, the media, schools, the workplace, and in the religious and in the religious sphere the religious sphere, could, taking into account the overall context, include, but are not limited to, one, calling for, aiding, or justifying the killing or harming of Jews in the name of a radical ideolog ideology or an extremist view of religion. Making Second bullet point, making men delicious, dehumanizing, demonizing, or stereotypical allegations about Jews as such 
or the power of Jews as collective, such as, especially but not exclusively, the myth of a world Jewish conspiracy, or of Jews controlling the media, economy, government, or other societal institutions. Um, well, so there's a Jewish newspaper, well, an Israeli newspaper, I should say, called the Times of Israel. And their headline is, on one of their newspapers was, Jews do control the media, or something along that line. I'm just curious, would that be considered anti-Semitism? Uh, if I quoted that newspaper, would I be guilty of anti-Semitism? I mean, I'm just reporting what they're saying. I don't know. Next bullet point. Accusing Jews as a people of being responsible for real or imagined wrongdoings committed by a single Jewish person or group, or even for acts committed by non-Jews. Next bullet point. Denying the fact, scope, mechanism, e.g. gas chambers, or intentionality of the genocide of the Jewish people at the hands of Nationalist Socialist Germany and its supporters and accomplices, during World War II, the Holocaust. Next bullet point. Accusing the Jews as a people or Israel as a state of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust. Next bullet point. Accusing Jewish citizens of being more loyal to Israel or to the alleged priorities of Jews worldwide than to the interests of their own nations. Next bullet point. Denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Next bullet point. Applying double standards by requiring of it a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Next bullet point. Using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, e.g., listen carefully, claims of Jews killing Jesus. Claims of Jews killing Jesus were blood liable to characterize Israel or Israelis. Um, does the Bible, does the New Testament say who was responsible for killing Jesus? Well, it does, and we're going to get back to that real soon. Stay tuned. Next bullet point. Drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Next bullet point. Holding Jews collectively responsible for actions of the state of Israel. Anti-Semitic acts are criminal when they are so defined by law. For example, denial of the Holocaust or distribution of anti-Semitic materials in some countries. Uh, there are countries that you can say that it would have been impossible for six million Jews to have died in the Holocaust and five and a half million to have survived collecting reparations from Germany, which uh, if you add that up, six plus five and a half is eleven and a half, when the World Jewish Congress says that there was only 12 million in the entire world. So does that mean 95% of every Jew in the world was in a concentration camp? You can go to prison in a lot of countries for saying that, especially Germany. I mean, I'm just, you know, throwing that out there. It's not illegal in the United States 
yet. Criminal acts are anti-Semitic when the targets of attacks, whether they are people or property, such as buildings, schools, places of worship, and cemeteries, are selected because they are or are perceived to be Jewish or linked to Jews. Anti-Semitic discrimination is the denial of Jews of opportunity or services available to others and is illegal in many countries. Hmm. Okay. So let's read that thing again. Using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, e.g., Claims of Jews killing Jesus. Claims of Jews killing Jesus. Uh, does the Bible, the New Testament, say that the, who killed Jesus? Well, I think it does. So let's take a look at a few things. And you tell me, does that meet the definition of anti-Semitism? Now, this is the U.S. Department of State. This is not only applies to the United States as of now. And right now, it's a non-legally binding. But of course, that can change. That can definitely change. So let's take a look at some Bible verses about who killed Jesus. Why don't we? Now, please understand, I'm just a reporter. I'm just reporting the facts. I'm not saying I agree. I'm not saying I disagree. I just think this is very important information and if uh jesus is a semite well we wouldn't want to be anti-semitic against him now would we no certainly not all right let's uh take a look at luke chapter 23 now my recommendation is to use the king james bible uh, it's been in existence for 400 years plus. And, uh, you know, it's there's uh, very few people that uh, actually speak against it. It's considered a reliable source among Christians, that is. So let's look at Luke 23. Verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. Who do they led? Christ. They led Christ. Jesus. I'm sorry. Well, we won't say Christ. We'll just say Jesus, right? And they led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute or taxes and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he, Jesus, answered him and said, Thou sayest it. That's basically like, If you say so. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Now, the chief priests here are not Catholic priests. These are the Jewish temple priests. They're in charge of temple. Catholic priests don't exist at this point in time in history. Now, you better believe Pilate was in charge of this area. And when you got somebody following Jesus around, 500 men, I mean, 5,000 men at a clip. You better believe Pilate is going to send some spies out there to, you know, keep an eye on this guy, make sure he's not, you know, trying to raise an army to cause trouble for Rome. You know, or who is this guy? 
Is he a rabble rouser? Is he trying to raise an army to fight Rome? What's up? So, you know, you would have several spies go follow this Jesus around. What is he teaching? What is he saying? And, uh, you know, gathering evidence in case uh, you need to build a case against him. Evidently, Pilate and his spies couldn't find anything wrong. So, you know. Now, here's an interesting verse. In Mark 15, 10, it says, For he, Pilate, knew that the chief priests, the Jewish priests, had delivered him, uh, Jesus, for envy. For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. They were envious of Jesus. I mean, can you imagine if Pilate had all these spies following Jesus around and he's doing all these alleged miracles? And even in the Jewish writings, the Babylonian Talmud, they even admit that Jesus performed miracles. So let's go back to Luke. So according to the Bible, if you believe that sort of thing, the uh, chief priest had delivered him that, uh, Jesus to Pilate for envy. So, Luke 23, 3. And Pilate asked him, Jesus, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it, if you say so. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked the man, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Ah, this guy's in Herod's jurisdiction. I'm going to let Herod deal with this guy. Verse 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see of him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. So evidently, Herod wants to see a magic show, if you believe the book of Luke. Verse 9. Then he questioned him in many words. You know, Herod questioned Jesus in many words, but he, Jesus, answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and viet vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. Enmity is hatred. So here it is, they kind of kissed and made up, I guess you could say. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, verse 14, listen, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him. I don't find anything wrong with this guy. Verse 15. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him, you know, I'm going to whip him, and release him. Now well, this is Pilate speaking. I'm going to chastise him and release him. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast, P Passover. 
And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, Pilate wants to release Jesus here, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Now, who's saying this to Pilate? Who brought Jesus unto Pilate? The chief priest, the Jewish priest. Verse 22, And he said unto them the third time, why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified and the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. Very interesting. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Hmm, okay. Now the Bible says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. How about a second witness? John chapter 19. Now, who does that sound like killed, uh, one of Jesus killed? Does that sound like Rome and Pilate? It doesn't sound like that to me. Would that meet the definition of anti-Semitism? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, who's going to decide that? A Baptist preacher? A Catholic priest? A Buddhist monk? How about a Muslim? How about a rabbi? I mean, who's going to be the judge and decide if that's anti-Semitic hate speech? I don't know. I don't know. So John chapter 19. Let's get a second witness here. Verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Uh, purple is the color of royalty. So they're, you know, they're mocking him, making fun of him. Verse 3, and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. So they're smacking him around. Verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Verse 5, then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, the Jewish priests, right? Therefore an officer saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. I don't find anything wrong with this guy. What's your beef with him? I don't get it, guys. Verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, I wonder what Pilate spies had uh, reported to him, you know, hey, this guy's doing miracles, you know, raising the dead and giving sight to the blind and uh, the crippled and lame or can walk, uh, you know, uh, he fed 5,000 men with women and children. 
Uh, we didn't see any carts with loaded with bread and fish, but yet everybody got fed. You know, that's some weird stuff going on with this guy. You know, one person tells you this, you might think, ah, they're exaggerating. But if you had three or four spies following, you know, Jesus around and everybody's telling you the same story, you might like, you know, raise an eyebrow and think, huh, what's up with this? And you, you, when you send spies out, you don't, you make sure they don't know each other. You know, you make sure they're not talking to each other to get their story straight. You know, that's how it works. We have a law, and by our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Verse 8. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Pilate was afraid, but the chief priest? No. Verse 9. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? Oh yeah? You're not going to talk to me? Don't you know that I can kill you? Or I can let you go? Verse 11. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Wow, the people that delivered Jesus unto the pilot have the greater sin. Verse 12. Listen to this. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Pilate sought to release him. Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So here it is, they're saying, you let Jesus go, we're going to accuse you before Caesar of being a traitor and see how you like it. I mean, that's the modern translation, so. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests, the Jewish priests here, the chief priests answered, We have no king, but Caesar. Okay. Now, does that sound like Pilate and Rome killed Jesus? I mean, so is the New Testament basically anti-Semitic? I mean, who decides? Is a rabbi going to decide whether it's anti-Semitic or not? Or a Buddhist monk? Or, you know, Catholic priests? How about a Baptist uh, minister? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Who's going to decide? So, what about John 5? 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. 
Well, he was, you know, healing people and doing miracles on the Sabbath day. Let's skip to verse 18, John 5, 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, Jesus, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Wow. So didn't we read about that in, you know, we just read that. How about John 7 and verse 1? And after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. Now, Galilee was in Samaria, which was different than Judah. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, that definitely sounds, by that definition, anti-Semitic. Acts 9.23 Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, that's talking about, I think, Paul. Well, let's read what. Uh, let's read Acts twenty three twelve. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together, you know, certain of the Jews, not all of them and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. So they didn't like Paul, I guess, if, you know, if the Bible is true. Now, I'm just a reporter. I'm not saying it is true. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just reporting. That's all I'm doing. How about reading the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 14 through 16. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God. What? Let's read that again. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Who, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God. Um, I don't hear, I don't read Rome in there anywhere, do you? Uh... You know, if anybody could find Rome in there, let me know, because I, I would really, I, I just can't find it. Maybe I'm not a very good detective. So, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Huh. So, you know, if you go by the U.S. Department of State's working definition of anti-Semitism, sounds to me like the New Testament would be guilty as charged. Let's go back to that and read that again. About the... Uh, let's take a look. All right, let's take a look at that again. Defining anti-Semitism. 
Using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, e.g. claims of Jews killing Jesus. Well, it looks to me that the Bible is absolutely guilty of the U.S. State Department's definition and the international... Let's see, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. But remember now, this is a non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism. So, one other thing you might want to take a look at is the Noahide Laws. N-O-A-H-I-D-E, like Noah, you know, the ark, N-O-A-H, and then I-D-E, Noahide. I guess it sort of rhymes with genocide. But uh, take a look at that in the Noahide laws. Very interesting. That's beyond the scope of my reporting here. So let's just uh, leave it at that. And, um, you know, I just wanted to point these things out so that everybody could, uh, you know, be better informed. And, you know, we need to know about anti-Semitism. I mean, after all, the uh, Department of State considers it very important, you know, and they even have a an office with a special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. And by the way, do you know who was the in charge of the Department of State under President Obama? Hillary Clinton. So it's, you know, it's an important office, very important office. The present head of the uh, Secretary of State, who replaced, um, well, took, took Hillary Clinton's place, well, you know, we're talking about under Obama, and then you had Cl Trump, well, now you've got Biden, but uh, the the... Secretary of State, who's the head of the Department of State, is, his name is Anthony, Anthony John Blinken, B-L-I-N-K-E-N. -E and he, uh, very interesting career here. He uh, attended Harvard. But I want to read to you the Wikipedia article on Anthony Blinken. Early life and education. Now, this is straight from the Wikipedia page. Blinken was born on April 16, 1962 in Yonkers, New York to Jewish parents... Judith Frem and Donald M. Blinken, the former United States ambassador to Hungary. Now remember, Hungary was a communist country back then. His maternal grandparents were Hungarian Jews. Blinken's uncle, Alan Blinken, served as the American ambassador to Belgium. His paternal grandfather, Maurice Henry Blinken, was an early backer of Israel who studied its economic viability, and his great-grandfather was the author of Yiddish literature, Mayor Blinken. Hmm. Very interesting.
And of course, they uh, say he, Blinken told the story of his stepfather, who was an, the only Holocaust survivor of the 900 children of his school in Poland. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay, well, that's nice. So, um, very interesting. All right, well, I think we've done enough research here, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the reporting. And um, what can I tell you? So this is uh, Bob Walker, a chaplain of the gospel. Goodbye. <laughs>